Uh, so let me set the stage for my talk, which is about a family of Diophantine equations that originates with work of Markov. So in 1880, Markov was studying the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 3xyz in relation to binary quadratic forms. And the integer solutions to this equation are also related to Diophantine approximation by the Markov spectrum. So in 1907, Hurwitz decided to study the generalization of this Diophantine equation to more variables. So let me write it like this. And there's a slightly more general form of this equation, which is discussed in Mordell's book on Diophantine equations, where you allow uh, an additive parameter k. So, So this is what my talk's going to be about. So can you say a little bit about the motivation for these uh, particular, uh, I mean, you said something about the advancing approximation? Right, so I skipped over the number theory stuff really quickly, but I'm going to actually spend about 10 minutes talking about the relationship between these equations and, and geometry. Okay. Yeah. So I've got two motivations, geometry and number theory. Uh, since it was the mathematical physics seminar, I decided to go more in the geometry direction. You were very smart. Okay, so there. Wonder why these equations were particularly interesting. Okay. <coughs> so none of the mirror symmetry people are here, but they're all coming up with this Markov equation all the time, probably in connection with the uh, symplectic manifolds, classification of uh, surfaces. So I, I, let, let, I have got this in my talk, so okay. let me. Uh, <laughs> okay, so n, a, and k will always refer to these parameters. n will be at least three, a will be at least one, an integer, and k will be any integer. Uh, I'll call the variety defined, the affine variety defined by this equation v. And the main question in my talk is going to be, what is the size of the intersection of a ball of radius r with the integer points on this variety? So the ball is always with respect to L infinity norm, so it controls the size of the maximal entry of the point. So this, this question is also connected to geometry that I'll explain now. In special cases, these varieties are connected to geometry. One is that when n is 3, a is 1, and k is 0, the relevant topological surface is the one's puncture torus. Okay, th <laughs> okay, this is a puncture, but I don't like a cusp. Um, so how is this related? Well, I want to talk about Teichmuller space. The Teichmuller space of this surface is the, the, set of, the set of all finite area hyperbolic structures on the surface. It has a natural real analytic structure. And so it turns out there's a natural map from the Teichmuller space of this surface. Let's call it T2 minus a point to the positive real points of the variety for these specific parameters. And how does this work? So any free homotopy, OK, for a fixed hyperbolic structure, then for any free homotopy type of non-peripheral simple closed curve, there's a unique geodesic representative for this curve. And this gives you a way to measure the length of the curve. So where does this map come from? It comes from drawing a torus like this. So you have a simple closed curve called alpha, one called beta. And let's also consider another one called gamma. And let's put a puncture here. 
So the way this map works is you take your hyperbolic structure and you measure the length of the three curves in that structure. And then you apply some hyperbolic trigonometric function to each of those coordinates. It gives you three real numbers. These three real numbers live on this variety. Why do they satisfy some equation? So this equation comes from the fact that the matrix representing monodromy around the cusp has to be unipotent. OK, so this is all well known. Kind of recent about this is actually when n is 4, a is 1, and k is 0. Huang and Norbury recently noticed that a similar story happens for the surface, not, not the torus minus a point, but rp2 minus 3 points. So there's a natural map from the Teichmuller space of rp2 minus 3 points to the positive real points on the variety again. And I actually want to draw the picture for this as well. So the way this works is, OK, this is glued to this. This is a picture of rp2 with three punctures, one, two, three. And I want to draw, I want to draw four simple closed curves on this rp2 minus three points that pairwise intersect once. Let's see if I can do that. So let's draw the first one like this. And then the other one should be like here and here. OK, that's three of them. Where's the last one go? I think it does. Let's see. So that'll work. OK, so there's four curves. You have a hyperbolic structure. This you read. This one's the same one as the previous one. Uh, the different parameters. So this is. Oh, you're saying one of the curves is. Which, which one is it the same as? How do I actually draw? <coughs> oh, you're right. Ugh. OK, it can be done. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Uh, OK, so let's put a question mark over that. It works. OK, so you get four coordinates, and you land inside v of r plus. Hmm. So wh one thing to point out about these curves, though, is that there's a subtlety. They're one-sided curves, which means that when you thicken them, you get a Mobius band. So the fact that these can exist is, a fact, is to do with the fact that RP2 is not orientable. So there's something new going on here in this picture. Okay. Yeah, it's there's uni uh -huh, uh -huh. Does anybody see how to actually draw this curve? Um, wait, so the th leave it as an exercise. Okay, exercise is okay. find the fourth. So there are actually there are there are integer points in these varieties. So what, what's the meaning of that integer point from the point of view of Teichmuller space? Let, let's find them. So n is three, a is one, k is zero. That's just this equation. And I think three, three, three should be a solution here. So so this point on the variety corresponds to some hyperbolic structure. It turns out to be the hyper an arithmetic hyperbolic structure with the maximum amount of symmetry. And it also has the maximum systole. So there's a similar story here. There's a point on this variety, which is uh, 2, 2, 2. And Huang and Norbury prove this is also uh, the hyperbolic structure with the maximum systole. So for n is bigger than 4, I don't, there's no geometric picture. Oh, uh, or par part of the boundary, maybe? Yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, so like it does. Ah, great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> no? <laughs> it's, it's the boundary? Yeah, just go along the boundary. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Thank you. 
I actually practiced, I practiced put join this picture and I managed to still not get it right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when n, is when n is bigger than four, I don't know of a geometric picture. Okay, so I also want to tell you that these maps are equivariant for certain group actions. So even forgetting about geometry, the interesting thing about these varieties is that they have infinite non-abelian groups of automorphisms, by which I mean automorphisms of the complex points. But the really fascinating thing is that even if you just ask for complex automorphisms, you get automorphism, automorphisms that are defined over z. So you get dynamics of the automorphism group of the variety on the complex points, real points, but moreover, the rational points, integer points, and also points over finite fields. So it was known um, you know, in different amounts of generality that to, to these three authors that there's actually only finitely many orbits of the automorphism group on the integer points of the variety. So let me record that. So v of z mod alt v is finite. And we actually know exactly what the automorphism group is. So it's a theorem of who, Tan, and Shang. That, let me write this abstractly, and then I'll tell you what everything actually is. Alt of v is, OK, so it has a component, which is the free product of a cyclic group of size 2 with itself n times. And this is a semi-direct product with uh, a finite group. The finite group itself is a semi-direct product of some finite group n with a permutation group on n letters. So let me tell you what all these things are doing to the variety. Sn is this, is, this is permutations of the coordinates. n is even sign changes. by which I just mean flip the sign of an even number of the coordinates. And the C2, th this, this free product is possibly the most interesting part. So this uh, free product comes from Markov moves. So let me, let me tell you what a Markov move is. So you can do a Markov move at any of the coordinates. I mean, this is going to play a big role in the rest of the talk. You can do one of these moves at any coordinate. What you do is you freeze all the other coordinates, then you get a quadratic in that coordinate, and then flip the root. So let's say I want to flip the root at x1. Well, I know that the sum of the two roots is negative the linear coefficient of x1. So the new root is x1 prime, which is just going to be a x2 through xn, and then minus the old root. So there's one of these moves at each of the coordinates, and they're the generators for the factors of this free product. Any questions so far? So those are all the automorphisms. This is all, these are all the complex there automorphisms. There are no others. There, it's a, yeah, it's, it's their theorem that there are no others. Oh, so what did I mean when I said that these, this, these maps, by the way, these maps are real analytic diffeomorphisms. What did I mean when I said they're equivariant for a group action? OK, so what acts here, the automorphism group, what acts here? the mapping class group of the surface. So these maps are equivariant after suitable identification of some subgroup of the automorphism group, which stabilizes, uh, this should be plus, the positive real points, and then some. So these automorphisms have geometric meaning, or, s or some of them do anyway. OK, so now that we learned about the variety, let me return to the main question. So let's see if I can like flip these boards around. Okay. Okay. So the main question is, what's the size of how many integer points are in a ball of radius r? So when n is 3, the best possible theorem here, or the, the best known theorem here is due to McShane and Riven. The result tells you that there is some positive constant
very strong error term, which just takes the form O log R, log log R. Yes, when k is 0. Uh, let me put that in. So n is 3, a is 1, k is 0. So the fact that it's connected to geometry also explains why these people were working on what I pose as a number theoretic question. Um, so I also want to point out that this, this theorem was um, followed on from earlier work of Zagier, who obtained an error term which had log log r squared instead of log log r. And the reason I want to point this out is because what I'm going to do is building crucially on what Zagier did. So we'll, uh, you'll learn about Zagier's method today. OK, so where, where does it get interesting? So I think what really got us interested in the problem was a very intriguing observation of Baragar. It's a small O. Right, so yeah, the Mirtikani's methods, which I'll talk about I mean, in, in a minute, but they, they generalize the surface. Right. And you know what C is? Okay. This is part of. Part It's a big part of Mirzakani's paper, actually, what the, how the constant depends on the point in moduli space. And I, I, I don't know enough about it to speak about it on camera. But you know something about it. Uh, Zagier gives a, in this specific instance where you're looking at the integer points in the variety, Zagier gives a, a formula for, um, it's, it's an infinite sum. It's a, it's a convergent infinite sum. So. OK, so the point of intrigue is the observation of Baragar in 1991, in his 1991 thesis, that if you try to generalize this to num higher number of variables, uh, I, I'm f just forget about the error term, make your job easier. What do you expect? If I look at n equals 4, is this going to be 3? And the answer is no. So. Baragar made this observation and then worked on it in subsequent years. So let me just tell you what the culmination of his work was. It's the theorem of Baragar that and this is in print in 1998. That if n is at least 4 and k is 0, there exists a number, beta, Depending on n, which is positive. And let's see. So it's nowhere near this. But it does tell you that you have a coarse polylogarithmic rate of growth in R. So let me tell you exactly what that means. So it's the size of the intersection. Is log R to the beta. But then there's a small O of 1 here. So this is not a true asymptotic formula. And Baragar estimated, for example, that beta of 3, beta of 4, sorry, is in the range 2.43 to 2.48. I'll just give you another example in case you're interested. Beta of 5 is between 2.73 and 2.80. And Baragar also proved that there is an asymptotic formula for how beta of n behaves as n goes to infinity. So beta of n is asymptotic to log n on log 2. So in 1995, Silverman asked the question. It's in print, so I'm kind of I'm reading it out, but I have to paraphrase because he, he uses an equation. Is it conceivable? So this question is sort of in two parts. Is it conceivable that there's a true asymptotic formula 
for this quantity. And then I think the emphasis in the sec is on the second part. And also, beta is an irrational number. I think he's mainly asking, is it possible that beta is irrational? So let me ask kind of a similar question of my own. Actually, OK, it's, it's not exactly my question. It's, it's based on conversations with my co-authors. Is it possible that there's a closed form expression for beta involving, for example, only rational functions, nth roots, and logarithms evaluated at integers? So I don't know the answer, whether this is true or not, or whether I expect this to be true or not. Yeah, so this question appears in uh, like proceedings of Columbia number theory seminar, and it's like situated amongst questions about Manning conjecture, and it doesn't exist as far as I can guess what, what beta for So as part of like our techniques, we get a characterization of beta. But it's certainly not a closed form. It's implicit in some sense. <coughs> You understand slightly more about it now than. I don't know. No, but it's something similar. This, that's an interesting question. So there is a Hausdorff dimension, and there. Okay, you, you'll hear the story. Yeah, so these people are considering k equals zero, and actually, I want to state our main theorem, which is joint with Alex Gambert and Ryan Ronan, for arbitrary k, which means I have to tell you something, which is that when k is not zero, there can be certain. Uh, solutions or points in this integer points in this variety that are, we call exceptional. Um, and what's exceptional about them is that the rate of growth when you intersect with the ball of radius r, it's not like poly log in r, it's actually like linear in r. So we want to really get rid of these, otherwise we can't write a clean, it's not the kind of growth we want to see, so we, we get rid of these in the statements. So I'll, what's that? Those could be empty. It's, it's true, they could be empty. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so let me use this notation, E, for the set of exceptional solutions. So in our paper, we write down exactly what they are. I mean, you solve for, you solve for what these are. I guess you're really counting the number of points in an orbit. It doesn't matter where you start. OK, I'm going to wait for you. Yeah. If you get trapped in one of these, you can get trapped in one of these. Okay, so the main theorem today is we prove the result to a true asymptotic formula. So when n is at least four, a is whatever, it's at least one, and k is uh, in z. Okay, so there is an important uh, assumption in the theorem. If v of z minus the exceptional solutions is infinite, which is a subtle question for general k, then there is some constant depending on n, a, and k, such that the size of this intersection is really, you have an asymptotic formula. <coughs> Let me write it like this, c plus small o of 1. Ah, yes, I wanted to write like this. 
Thank you. Is, is this what you were saying? Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and just to understand that the, the other part, if you would not say, if your present thing would have. Uh, yeah, it would say like constant times R. It would, it would ruin, you wouldn't see any of this. And the exceptional ones are the stable ones with the KPL and the amount of moves <coughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah. Is your exceptional set invariant under the other uh, It's invariant under Markov moves. Which is, which is what I really use. So I, I don't, I'm not going to end up using the whole automorphism group. Um, so like n is permuting, n doesn't preserve the positive, positive real points. I'm going to end up working with like v of z plus, and I, I don't want to use this. And I also don't really use this, so I'm just going to use this part. Yeah. Wait, how do you know that v of z plus is good enough? I mean, if k is a that's, a, that's a good question. Most solutions will have no no positive. If you look at Markov's equation, this this one. The, uh, the very first, yeah. So with the one and plus k, for at least for n equals three, so the whole range of signs of k for n equals one, for which actually most solutions have negative entries. K negative. So, yes, for k negative. So so you can always ch sign change so that you have what one or zero negative signs, or or in other words, so this this. Yeah. Sure, but if I can e if I can even sign change to get to a positive solution, then I'll count I count them at the same time. So the ones that are troublesome are the ones that have say <coughs> one negative, one negative one. right? And then. I mean, they're different equations. K, K or A though. Yeah, I, I do. I do want to. So the problem is, like, k could be negative, and then this could be negative. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't make sense because this is positive. No, but the one that makes sense is the product being negative and k being positive, and then you might not have an element of the other plus. So I guess I mean. My so, but so so, so if 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 this is negative and this is positive, can't I move this to this side? Then I have something that's basically. Yeah. After I fit this. No, no, but you, you say that you're going to count B of Z plus, not B of Z. Um, so I'm asking you, is the theorem of B of Z or not B of Z plus? I mean, there's a subtle point here which is connected with what he's saying. And he knows that very well because he's found this condition himself. So if you can study about the, the map, you know, when, K is, when, when the action of the mapping <coughs> group on the real variety is ergodic, mm -hmm. then what are you doing? But can, can, I tr can I try to like just address this issue? So if k is positive, then one of these is negative, and change coordinates so like they're all positive coordinates, and you have a negative sign here. Move this to the other side, and then you're trying to solve this plus. Let's say you change x1 to x1 tilde, x1 tilde like through xn is equal to k is equal to k where k is positive. But there's only finitely many solutions like this, so I throw them out. I think I checked this and it was okay. So, yeah. So there are two different types of things, but and now I'm solving for these. Let's say this is also called this, where these are all positive integers. There is an issue. Uh, even in, when you prove the finiteness, you don't really learn where the two guys are equivalent under this group because they could be equivalent way up unless the action. Uh, I just at some point 
orbits. In some sense, eventually I look at an orbit under a certain so certain type of move. Yeah. But okay. I understand that. Yeah. I agree with Chelsea. Okay. That's that's good. I did think about this at some point. In our paper, we have VOC plus, and then I, later I thought about it, and I, I realized we didn't need to write it like that. Hmm. Okay, so let me just let me just say something in words. So this hasn't been written up yet, um, but it's actually possible to use our techniques to go into this theorem that I'm going to explain to prove that for any Fuchsian structure on RP two minus three points, if you count the number of one-sided simple closed curves of length less than or equal to L. There's an asymptotic formula for this, and it's constant times L to the beta. And this is in contrast to Mirzakani's results for counting on orientable surfaces where the exponent is an integer. It's the dimension of compactly supported measured laminations. OK, so that you have to work somehow to like deal with an arbitrary orbit of the automorphism group on the real points. OK, so in the second half of the talk, I want to explain the ideas of the proof. So the philosophy of the proof is to put Zagier's argument in contact with the thermodynamical formalism and symbolic dynamics. If that was all you needed to do, then perhaps the paper would be much shorter. Unfortunately, along the way, you encounter two problems that are sort of fundamental and you need to work to get around. I'll point these out as I go, and I'll explain the solution to the problems at the end. I also want to give the proof, making some simplifying assumptions, that I want to assume that a is equal to 1, n is greater than or equal to 4. Just then a won't appear in any of my equations using Markov moves. That's nice. And I'll also make k is 0. So I won't, have, I won't have any exceptional solutions, and I won't have to worry about that. So the first part of the proof is a passage to something to do with orbits. So what you want to first do is to find some compact part of the positive real points of the variety, such that outside this compact part, you can keep track of what, what is the largest coordinate of your tuple. So part one is you establish there is some compact k, such that for x not in k, OK, like I said, I'm passing to the case of positive integers. Three nice things happen. So first one is that the largest coordinate is unique. OK. That's just psychological, mostly. <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> OK. B, if you do a Markov move at a coordinate which is not the largest, it becomes the largest. A Markov move at the non-largest coordinate makes it the largest. And C is the same sentence with non-largest and largest interchanged. <coughs> so let me write it like this. So this is a, the fact that you can do this is a coarse version of facts that were known to Markov and Hurwitz. It basically says there's an infinite descent for solutions. I don't mean I don't mean I don't mean it like that. I mean out of the of X, the one coordinate which is the biggest one oh, is, is unique. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm not I didn't prove this. <laughs> OK, this is very nice. So <laughs> so it's a consequence of establishing these three properties that outside of k, 
V of Z plus breaks up into a finite number of orbits where you only do type B moves. So you're only going to do moves that increase the largest entry. So you have a compact piece, some number of points on the periphery of this, and then you have finitely many orbits under, I would call those outgoing moves. So as a consequence of this, you can kind of recode your problem. And this is also mostly psychological. So you're going to recode your problem so that you deal with ordered, ordered tuples. And you have these moves. Uh, let's say lambda j is going to act on an ordered tuple. And what it does is it does the Markov move at the j's place and then puts them back into order. But you actually know that if you do that, what will happen is that you'll lose the entry at the j's place. So I'll write a hat, it's been omitted. And then it, the actual new coordinate will pop up at the end. So this is just the Markov move I told you about before. So what I told you about k and breaking up into finitely many orbits is that we actually reduced our question to a question for this free semigroup lambda, which is defined to be the free semigroup generated by lambda j, such that 1 is between j and m minus 1. You have to check, but it's a free semigroup. It's a free non-linear semigroup. This notation just means you'll take concatenations of these maps without taking inverses. Why are there only n minus, n minus 1 well, where there were n moves? Well, there's only n minus 1 things now because we only do moves that go that increase entries. Okay, and so the question is reduced to what's the size of the intersection of a ball of radius r with an orbit under lambda? Okay. So this is all in Zagier's argument. Okay. So that was uh, phase one. Let's see if I want to do this. So part two, so I actually might do some analysis, like easy analysis. So I want to make some statements in analysis. And the thing is, the quality of these statements improves with the following quantity. Alpha z is defined to be the product of the n minus 2 smallest coordinates of z, zj. So it's, 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 a it's a quantity you attach to every ordered tuple. And so the statements I make get better when this gets bigger. The first statement is that actually, and I also want to use some notation, which is if I write log of a vector, it means I take log of all the coordinates. So the first statement is that if I have a z, then log of z is going to be close to So how close? Well, it, it's, it's like scales like alpha z inverse, say. A hyperplane h. So this is a hyperplane defined by y1 plus yn minus 1 is yn. And this lives inside a positive cone. OK. And so how do, you, how do you actually work this out? You have to look at the equation. Just OK, it follows directly from, from looking at the equation. The second one is a bit more subtle. It says that, so here's z. And I could do lambda j to z. I mean, in some sense, you're linearizing. The yes, absolutely. Yeah, this should be called, this session could be called, should be called linearization. <laughs> yeah, so everything I say, you can interpret it in terms of measured laminations when n is 4. So you may also take log of this. I'm doing something awkward where I'm writing behind this. So you get log z. OK, and then you could also take log of this. OK, so you get log of 
lambda j of z. And the statement is that if log z is close to y, let's say it's epsilon close to y, then this thing here is epsilon close to something that you get by doing some linear transformation to, lo to log of z, then this thing here is epsilon close to what I'll call gamma j of y. So this is compared to y. And this is actually, this is a really, this is a very um, like simple observation. It's in some sense if you think that of all these coordinates of being large, more precisely if alpha is large, then you can drop this last thing here. So when you take logarithms, this just becomes a sum. So what is that, what is that move? Oh, sorry. So actually, gamma j of y1 through yn is, OK, so what, what does this look like at level of logarithms? You drop the jth one. And then what comes at the end is sum i not equal to j y i. So for this to hold, you want epsilon to be on the scale of alpha z inverse, alpha z to the minus 2. OK. And so what have we reduced to? There's a further reduction. So now the question is, what's the size of a ball of radius log r intersected with the orbit of some point O under gamma, where gamma is the free linear semigroup generated by the gamma j? OK, so you want this kind of reduction. But we think we hit our first problem. So the first problem is that alpha z may not be big. In fact, it may not be big for infinitely many different things. So wh why does alpha z not have to be big? Because if you just apply lambda m minus 1, you just change the last two coordinates. So the first two don't change, and alpha z never changes. So you can go to infinity without this parameter getting big, and that this kind of approximation never kicking in. So that's problem one. Right, let me explain why. So alpha z might not be big. <coughs> so this is not an issue for Zagier, indeed, because Zagier has a better function than log. It comes from hyperbolic trigonometry. It, it involves an arc cosh. And so Zagier's function is, is like log, but it improves. These statements improve for Zagier as long as any coordinate is large, which has to happen. So there's an issue. Okay. We don't have this, this magic function. Okay. So part three. So let's just ignore this problem for now and say we're going to get around it. And then we actually have techniques to deal with orbits of linear semigroups. So what does it mean for alpha z not to be big? It may not go to infinity. So like you may not be able to take epsilon going to zero here. So you're like fit, you're basically fitting you're fitting a linear orbit to like a nonlinear orbit. Okay, there is some initial bootstrap to get out to the, out to this stage where this becomes you want to bootstrap up to where alpha z becomes large, so like the fitting becomes better and better. But the problem is that like you can actually go to infinity in the orbit without alpha z growing at all. So this fitting won't really get better and better, and it'll, you'll just have an error that you can't deal with. And alpha z might not be big just because there's a move you can do that doesn't change the first m minus coordinates at all. O is something, but it's essentially going to be like log of one of the original O's. Yeah. So O is going to live in H. Yeah, it's worth pointing out as well that this, when you write out the matrices for these, they have zeros in them, so they look singular, but they actually act on this hyperplane, so they're not singular.
Okay, so how do you deal with uh, linear semigroups? Let me talk about this at a high level. So there are two uh, big ideas. The first one is Lally's renewal method. So the idea here is that you have a free semigroup. So you're counting over a tree. OK, you're not counting with respect to word length. But still, because you count over a tree, there is a recursion for the count that takes place over the tree. This is called the renewal equation. And actually, if you're really clever about this recursion, you can set up your counting, your counting quantity so it has two inputs. First of all, the counting parameter, say log r. And second of all, well, maybe where you're starting from in the count. But if you're clever, you can do better and actually make your counting quantity depend only on the projectivization of this point. So what I'm saying is that you have some recursion that takes place on the projectivization of this hyperplane. Let's, let me give that a name. It plays a big role. There's something non-trivial even above what you. What you well, what did he do? That's my question. He uses. Uh, I, I, I don't actually, I don't know the answer. Ah, uh, this is this is this is the big idea in our. Yeah, this is our. He talks about some kind of L, like L function that's associated to this Euclid tree, and then somehow he compares it. I, I don't, I don't actually, I don't actually know. <coughs> okay, so what's going to really play in this recursion, or even just the way the recursion is stated, involves the action of this linear semigroup on this. This is actually a simplex. Okay. So let's look at what that picture looks like. How does the linear semigroup act on this simplex? So the picture is that here's the simplex. This is all of delta. So this is delta. OK. And so this picture is going to tell you for the first, OK. It's going to really give you a picture that makes you realize why beta is not going to be an integer. The thing is that, OK, let, let me do it in the case of n equals 4. Then I'm drawing something two-dimensional because my hyperplane cut down by one dimension and I projectivize, so I cut down by one more. So I'm drawing a two-dimensional simplex. And I have three generators of gamma. So what happens is that the first generator maps the whole of delta into this triangle. The second generator maps the whole of delta into this triangle. This is gamma 2. And the third generator maps the whole of delta into this triangle down here. They're disjoint apart from their boundaries. So in particular, there's a hole. So they're acting, they're acting projective linearly. So there's a hole here. And actually, if you keep iterating the, the linear semigroup, the holes will proliferate. And in fact, the actual attractor of this linear semigroup is a fractal inside the simplex. OK, so there's a fractal attractor. OK, so you can actually see I, I drew this wrong. How did I know I drew it wrong? It should have been like this. OK, 
Okay, so this is gamma one, gamma two. Okay, you, you made me realize I drew it wrong. Because the n equals three picture is actually contained inside this picture on this line. And you see that there's no hole. Right. Okay. So uh, let me say a few words about thermodynamical formalism. I'm not going to. No. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll explain in one minute. So, what is the thermodynamical formalism? The thermodynamical formalism, just in this context, is an, it attempts to understand such a dynamical system in terms of <coughs> physical quantities like entropy and pressure. This formalism is useful in two se settings. Or, or in a setting, a setting where you have two things. The first is um, good symbolic dynamics. So here, the semigroup is free, so the symbolic dynamics is as good as it gets. Okay, so what do you actually need to do to convert just some kind of? Do you know which words are, or every, I guess, the groups, the semigroup's free, but in describing in terms of what's happening on your limit set there, Yeah, uh, this is a Markov partition. Ah, okay. So, so you need to actually input something into this formalism. So, what are the two things you input? The first is that you want the semigroup generators to uniformly contract. Okay, that's one thing you want. The second thing you want is kind of more complicated, but you want the relevant co-cycle, which in this case is log of the Jacobian. Okay, so you have some log Jacobian co-cycle. You want this log Jacobian co-cycle not to live in some bad cohomology class. This is what you truly need to get the small O error term. For example, you don't want its values to line up with integers. Okay, so there's problem two. Because something I said I wanted isn't true. Problem two is that, is that the gamma i don't uniformly contract. I'll explain this momentarily. But what is beta? Beta is an explicit rational multiple, it's 1 over m minus 1, times the unique real parameter in 1 infinity, such that when you multiply log Jacobian by this number, the pressure functional of this function is 0. So it's location of 0 of pressure functional. In this case, it doesn't coincide with Hausdorff dimension because there are different directions of expansion. There are yeah, different, basically different Lyapunov exponents. So that's our, that's our characterization of beta. Like the thermodynamical formalism tells you beta is some real parameter for which something happens. And it also tells you there exists certain measures with certain nice properties called conformal measures. Uh, they have a transformation law that contains beta as a parameter. OK, so we understood something about beta in terms of thermodynamics. How do we solve problem two? Sorry, just for the how does how do the dynamical system What is the dynamical system? OK, so what are the players in thermodynamical formalism? That's, that's a good question, because I forgot to say. What are the players in the thermodynamical formalism? There are certain operators on Banach spaces called transfer operators. Here are the relevant Banach spaces C1 of delta. Where do these operators come from? They actually arise organically here by taking a Laplace transform of the renewal equation. So the recursion that you have for the count, when you take a Laplace transform in the counting parameter, you get some functional equation involving some operators. These operators are called transfer operators, and you actually directly use that the generators are contracting to prove that these operators are basically smoothing some Banach space. Okay, they're improving regularity. Uh, yeah, perfect. So yeah, so where does that come from? So like as you iterate, like this this hole will proliferate. Like you, there'll be more and more holes. So say you look at all. It's hard to draw the picture, but say you look at like just all things like gamma one, gamma two, gamma one, gamma one, gamma one, gamma three, and like all cel busy cylinders of length two in terms of dynamics. There'll be more and more holes. So as as you proliferate this more and more. Yeah. 
yeah. Okay, and the only thing, yeah, the thing that's left is uh, the image of, the image of that one under. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It's not, it is not the house of the measure what's left. No, no, it's it's just much the side one. Uh, let me repeat. Did uh, Baragar have a description of beta in terms of something, or how did he describe it? Because you've got a remarkable nice interpretation. You must have had a description of beta. I think it's like the radius of convergence or something. No, they're, they're, they're both uh, contracting. No, so let's, let's try to deal with problem two. I mean, so the, the issue with contraction is down here. And so I can actually paint a really nice picture in terms of things maybe people have already seen in terms of what's actually going on here. Like, so what is actually the picture that you get when n is three? What is the actual dynamical system? It's related to something that's maybe well known called the Fari map. So here's a function from zero one to itself. And this function has slope one here and here. And it slopes up to here like this. Okay, I won't write the formula, it doesn't matter. It's called the Fari map. And so, the, okay, I told you the slope here and here is one. So this thing is not uniformly expanding. There's something kind of amazing here, which is like, okay, you know, this is given by x on one minus x, this part. And then this, there's a similar formula for this part. It's actually true that this well-known thing is actually exactly lines up with the dynamics on this segment. Like gamma two and gamma, th Gamma two and gamma three here are are precisely the inverse branches of the Fari map after you do a change of coordinates. So what is the solution? We borrowed this idea from Teichmuller dynamics. It features in the work of Zorich on flat surfaces, where Zorich calls this idea time acceleration. So the idea of time acceleration, I think somebody mentioned it, is that instead of just doing one iterate of semi-group generator, you do many until you pass through a good region. So for us, the good region is the image of gamma one and gamma two. And so concretely, the solution has a concrete, the problem has a concrete solution. You go back to the very start of your problem. You look at this semi-group lambda that you had before, and you replace the generators by a count countably infinite set of generators. So you, you actually change the semi-group to lambda prime be the things generated by lambda m minus one, lambda, lambda j times lambda m minus one to the a, where j is less than or equal to m minus 2, and a is a natural number. Okay, So that solves the problem, because the way in which you cannot uniformly contract, you kind of you speed through it. Okay, And so you have to go through the whole proof. Uh, you, just, you just replace your semi-group with something countably generated. So things become more technical throughout the proof. but you ultimately succeed with this. It solves both the problems at the same time. So those two problems are really tied up with each other. But what do you get if you do time acceleration in the case n is three? What does it, what does it give you? So I told you it's really the, fa the Fari map in disguise. When you time accelerate the Fari map, what you get is the Gauss map. Okay, so this is Gauss. So you can view our, our solution as a generalization of the Gauss map in higher dimensions. So let me stop there. Thanks. <laughs>